All right, welcome back, everybody. So I uh, want to make sure you understand that this is not uh, as simple as uh, grabbing the gun and blowing the car off and it looks like this. Uh, it's a lot more to it. And it's just like anything, you know, we're, we're using the technology of dry ice. We're using the knowledge of 45 years of trying to clean things and do things in a way that uh, it makes it the most presentable and people can see what it is. You know, we get some feedback once in a while about, oh, you're, you're uh, misrepresenting the car because you're cleaning it. Now I can't see where the oil leaks are and I don't know what the car, how it was cared for. Uh, well, that, that's a debatable subject and uh, you know, I, I can't say that that's wrong with regards to the oil leaks, but I can tell you one thing. Uh, if I came to look at this car as I wanted to buy it, there's nothing that I can't see. Uh, this is a little problematic. It looks cool, it looks interesting, but I, I can't see everything. So that's a whole other subject, but what we really want to focus on this morning is, is just to explain that after we cleaned this, we use a various products that, you know, nothing extraordinary about them, but it's just their cleaning products and treatment products that we want to wipe things down. This stuff is dry, it's not gummy and sticky and wet. And, but I, I don't know if you can see this. Uh, there's a spot right here that I left this right here is like, I won't do it. I did it a year ago. I licked the spot on the car, just as kind of a joke because it was so clean. Uh, but, but I would not be afraid to, to have uh, a meal off of this part of the car. Well, I wouldn't do it here. So watch my finger, I'll, I'll rub, or my thumb, and I'll rub that off. So there's a little film on there. So that's what we do. We, we follow up with a little handwork. The beauty is that after you've cleaned it, you've got the bulk and the grease and the grime and the tar and the road stuff off. Now you can go around, it's actually, um, if you're OCD, it's pleasant. It's fun to be able to do because you've, you've gotten the, the, the tough stuff out of the way. Uh, it is for certain that I enjoy the most taking the bulk stuff off and then doing the final like this because this is where it happens. This is where you really start to appreciate and get what you're after, you know, with all these zinc uh, plated parts and, you know, the rubber's rubber and it's just, it's fun. So uh, we'll finish this other side up and um, you've seen how this works. We're moving to the back of the car and we're going to show you uh, how we treat the exhaust and do some of the, the components in the back. Uh, stay with us. And we got a lot more to go, uh, a few more series for sure on just this car. So this is going to be pretty transformative here. You're going to enjoy this. Um, we got a, 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 a Borla exhaust. It's not stock, it's Borla. So we're going to make this look maybe brand new. Uh, it's not going to be just a one-step process, so the diff cover is going to look awesome because it's alloy. Um, Everything else is going to be pretty similar to that front suspension, so we'll get set up here and we're about ready to rock and roll. So whenever I'm near lightweight aluminum or exhaust shields, I'm always really careful about pressure and size because I don't want to dent it or make it look not stock. So I'm just going to tone things down a little bit while we do that shield. So what does that mean, tone it down? Uh, pressure. I'm, I already had my size at 0.3. I'm going to turn my pressure down to 24 PSI. So just, just a real light pressure. So if you look right here, this is the lowest pressure that I have. I still have impressions from 0.3 and 22 pounds. So it's just like aluminum foil you use in the kitchen. So there's just, I can't not put little dents in that. 
This is a classic case where you just gotta watch. I can't really go any further with that. That'll have to be hand work if they want it. So I'm going back up to we'll go over some big stuff. You saw what happened to that rubber <clears throat> in 50 years of trying to clean things. I've never been able to clean rubber so effectively, no matter what was on it, than using this process. It's so fun. So this is pretty interesting right here. Wasn't exactly sure what was happening, but we're good. It's just really thick cosmoline. So I might go up a little larger size particle to make that go a little quicker. So now we're one millimeter size. And yeah, it's hot today too. All right, here's what we're after. As before, we're not gonna just stay on it. I'm gonna let it get back to room temperature. I'll come back. We'll work that as time goes on. So that's just, this is the sort of thing that you can't explain to the client. You don't know when you're gonna run into this and it takes time and you gotta be patient with it. So that, that's what makes it so difficult to say, how long would it take to clean my car? You don't know what you're gonna run into and how these different coatings or dirt or grease are, are adhering to the car or the surface. It's gonna take some time. I'm gonna get the old man's chair out. Let's play around a little bit. I'll tell you what the settings are if it works. Yeah, we'll just keep working it. So that was one and a half, one and a half size, 85 PSI. I'm gonna tone things down back to 0.4 and 55. Just do some general cleaning. I want this to get back to room temperature and we'll keep pecking away at it once it's been a while.
So I'm jumping around a little bit. I'm testing out different surfaces because you know when I'm cleaning, I always got to be cognizant of where my overspray is going. And if I have something that's delicate or requires different settings, I want to make sure that I understand what's behind there. So I'm just just testing the waters a little bit, understanding what's going on here. All right, this is going to be some drama here. You're going to like this. So you might not have seen in our earlier videos, <clears throat> when you pull the trigger, it takes a while for the ice to come out, and then when you let off the trigger, it takes a while for the ice to stop coming and the air to stop. So you let off the trigger and you keep working and you wait, because if you don't, and you're working, and you just let go of the trigger and pull away, you can rip through something maybe you didn't want to. I go get a little tool for uh, tricks of the trade. Y'all probably have one of these. So why am I doing this? I don't want to damage the plastic with aggressive settings. So the fuel tanks are plastic and that surface is softer than the metal bands that have a powder coating. Right, the powder coat is really resilient. I'm gonna crank it up a little higher in the size. So there's risk involved with this. Obviously the bigger size can start taking the black powder coat or paint off or coating. Coatings are always the most vulnerable on the edges. So I'm gonna try this in the center of that strap on the pretense that I have less risk potentially. And then I work my way to the outside if I like it. I just want to make sure I'm not going through the coating so we look like we're good so far. We need ice. This reminds me of Tommy's car. This stuff is tough. We don't typically run into something like this, so I'm gonna go next level, like what we learned on Tommy's car. Uh, we're gonna spray a little cleaner on the brake cleaner on there, try to soften that coating up first. So I'm gonna let that flash for 10 seconds plus or minus and eat away at that, hopefully. A 
Okay, so you can see that's gonna take some patience and time. I'm gonna move on to more productive things for the camera. And then once the cameras leave today, then guess what I get to do? Dig in on that project. So both these straps, this, we'll all have to, I'll have to deal with that. But at least we have the process down now. All right, let's get back to having some fun. So if you missed it, you know, why is this dry process? Because when dry ice sublimates, it's, it doesn't create water. Why do we have moisture on our surfaces? Well, it's because it's about 80 to 80% 80 relative humidity today, and it's 82 degrees. So it's just like a glass of iced tea. If you're in Arizona and the humidity is 15%, there's no condensation in the ambient air. So you don't, the glass doesn't condensate. We got humidity and we got high temperatures, so that's a reality that we have to deal with. We have an offset for that in our final clean process. We turn the volume down so that the particles are few, so it doesn't create so much condensation, and then we don't have that problem. So that also speaks to the white cloud. If it's dry out, there's no white cloud. The more humid in the ambient air that you're dealing with, the more struggle you have with, just like you throw dry ice in a pool, you see that low hanging white cloud. So that's why it's really critical that you have the absolute driest air you can get coming out of this gun, because think about it. If it's humid out and the ambient temperature is creating condensation in this white gas, and you also have water coming out of your compressed air system, before this product even hits the car, you're going to have this white cloud from experience, I can tell you. You can't see anything. You have no idea what you're cleaning. So it's really critical that you have dry air and you try to work in an environment that's not humid. So I can't stress how control is so important and situational awareness. You really got to make sure that you're comfortable and you've got your footing and you know, I've trained a lot of guys now and I've had a lot of guys stand in front of something and want to clean it. It's like you, you stand in front of the home plate getting ready to hit a ball facing the pitcher. No, you know, get stable, get ready. You, know, you, you want to be able to make sure you have control of the gun. Okay, this totally sucks. Behind this perforated 
aluminum panel is aluminum, like basically aluminum foil. I, I can't clean that with the dry ice machine. There's no way. It'll blow right through that foil. It'll make dents in it. So I have to work around that, all that perforated foil that I would love to just blow it off. I can't because it's going to go right through. So that's just some of the deal. You got to manage it when you come across it. So this is why uh, early on I kind of coined a phrase and what I'm doing is automotive archaeology. You see what's happening here? We got a factory stenciled number on this bracket that you would never have known was there and you'd never see it until you start taking the stuff off. If you're using abrasive processes or chemicals, you risk that you'll never see that. tough stuff. I'm going to crank it up a little. Uh, one millimeter in size, 60 PSI. So, <clears throat> this is my pet peeve right here. <clears throat> of all the mistakes that I've seen so far in 13 years of following people that clean cars with dry ice, <clears throat> this is probably the number one mistake. So they'll go in here indiscriminately and start making passes and patterns, and I've seen curly cues and crazy uh, patterns, and if you don't have your settings right, you can remove some of the factory finish, and that's just forever, unless you repaint it. And now if it's an original car, you've lost that. So I'm really particular about that, and so I'm how I manage that, because even identical year make model cars have had different results for me. So I want to go to the most obscure place that's not noticeable, and I want to just play around with it. So you're not going to see this. We'll probably cut away. I'll, I, I got to get into the way up in the backside and just see what I think about this material. It's probably very similar to the front wheel well color and material, but I just want to experiment a little bit in a place that if I do screw up, it's obscure and it's not that much of a problem. I sure don't want it exposed in this space or on this flat surface. Yeah, it's the same. So we've got that process down pretty good. <clears throat> so I'm gonna work my way through this. I could definitely get the large gun out and we could use the large gun. Well, Matt's not in a hurry. 
I'm not in a hurry. I, I want you to see the careful version of what I do. If it's a domestic car that's worth not much money and I just want to make it clean, I'll get the big gun out and go crazy. Keep my patterns consistent and symmetric. But I, I like, you'll, you'll notice sometimes I pull further away. That's just to have less effect. So it's just a combination of managing your eyes, your visual, the motion, uh, kind of reverse painting as I've referred to before. And then, you know, we've got these dissimilar pock marks where you've got to go at different angles to get it totally clean. It's not just one pass. So let's see what we can do with this tire well. Alright, this is pretty cool. So, this is really getting into the weeds. But when the robot sprays this car, there's technoviolet drift that's coming in under this car. And if you look closely, you can see these dark lines basically on the high ridges of the small little mountain tops of texture and that paint is stuck to those high ridges. Well, you might think, oh, what is that? Is that dirt? Let me get that off. Well, once you start taking that off, you just, well, for the really picky people, and you know, some people are that picky, you've just altered the factory coatings of potentially a really special and important car. So what I've done, you might have noticed, I, I went at this lightly perpendicular, and then in all four directions, and that just came to light to me. So it's not only understanding the technique and the reality of what might be under there, but it's being prepared to discover and find these things and then uh, preserve them as best you can. And of course, that's gonna get more prominent the further we get back. So you see what I'm talking about? There's some total color on this, which is what you'd expect for that paint to have drifted in and hit here. So we want to protect that. Same thing here. So anything that's got any kind of facing toward the back of the car, we want to watch like the back of this is going to have purple on it. Conversely, if I've got dark features on the back side here, it's got to be dirt. The paint's not going to be there. So it's really critical that you understand the principle. And you know, look at the water we're dealing with here. That's just, that's the nature of our beast today. It's supposed to be really nice in a couple days, like 65 and no humidity. So if you have a client that doesn't care about this 
really picky stuff and you give them a big bill or I charge them a lot of money and they're like, geez, why did it take so long? Well, if I used the big gun and just went crazy under here, it would take five minutes. All of this textured surface, I'll probably spend an hour on that. So it's just about knowing what the client wants and, and act accordingly and, and do that job. So you can see where we're going here. Uh, this is coming out really nice. Never be afraid to do a little hand work. So in between a session like that, I'll get a little all-purpose cleaner and a white eraser and a rag, and I'll just I'll do some hand work. Just because just I want to try to replicate this car the way it, it finished the factory. So we're making some good progress. I think the camera can really get good in here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and spend some time up in here. So this is pretty cool. It's actually, it's a drain hole that was plugged with Cosmoline. So we're absolutely doing a service to this car by getting that drain hole unplugged. So you might have noticed I left that area and there was still Cosmoline inside that drain hole. I didn't want to just get crazy because I got a hard edge. I don't want to take any Technoviolet off there. So I left it alone, let it get to room temperature, let it swell a little, lose some more adhesion, go back to it, hit it again, knock it out, preserve the paint. In previous videos, I've commented, this is the foam eater. If you ever get attacked by foam, this is the weapon you want. So there's some pretty dense pads between these metal straps and the plastic. And there's just a little bit of uh, deterioration from the gun just now on one edge. So now I know I gotta be careful. I gotta stay away from that. It's not foam, but it's, it definitely could be, I could, if I just stayed on it, I could just blow it out of there completely. So I gotta stay away from that. All right, so here's some more Technoviolet. So we're always watching for that infiltration of color into the underbody. This is gonna be really fun right here.
Remove, repeat, remove, repeat. <laughs> so I think we've got like all the drama we need for this back quarter. It's just a matter of me spending hours now to finish it out. <clears throat> so I'll work on that and uh, we'll get this squared away and give you a little before and after uh, tomorrow. And I think it'll be, uh, I think you'll be pretty impressed. Yeah, so here's our weekly delivery in our market. Uh, we order and then we get our product the next week. And so I got my main man Curtis here is gonna drop off two bins for us. They're 500 pounds a piece. We've got these two bins over here that are empty. And uh, so they just swap them out. So we have two weeks to use them before they charge us an extra fee, um, which is not really a problem for us in the scope of what we've been doing lately. We're actually gonna get three bins next week. Um, so that's just how it works. And there are some markets in the U.S. and different parts of the country where you can order on a Monday and get it on Tuesday. We just don't happen to be one of those because this stuff is made from the exhaust of ethanol plants and that's up in Augusta, Georgia. So they got to you know, capture the CO2 there and then make it and then ship it down to us in Florida and get it here. So, so like if I want to, if I know I have jobs next week, I'm going to get my ice around noon on Wednesday and I want to work the following Tuesday, like we did yesterday, I have to order enough knowing that my ice is going to sublimate. It's going to be half gone in a week. So if I want 400 pounds for next Tuesday that I want to actually use 400 pounds, uh, I got to order 800 or have 800. Uh, and there's no way around it unless you want to spend another 100 grand and make your own dry ice, which I haven't gone to that level yet. Okay, so we're gonna continue to work our manual magic. Uh, so as I said multiple times, it's not just about using dry ice. Our, our air gas guy's gonna leave here in a minute, so we'll hear the truck, but uh, we're gonna do some, uh, some OSFO magic, if you will. I've mentioned before, and I kind of thought Mike would bring me one of Matt's wunderbar sprayers, but I didn't get one. <laughs> You see, it doesn't take much. Now, Borla has got a little, it's not a polished finish, so I'm not going crazy here. It won't take much to bring this back. It really does a nice job on the welds too. You can see that weld disappear right before your eyes. So I'm just gonna keep a nice, consistent, linear motion it's quadruple hot steel wool, so I've done polished surfaces with it. And so now I want to make sure to wipe it off. Okay, now here is the point in time where you got to make a decision. I think we can make this look better than Borla did. Uh, and I'll show you what I think here. Let's just go for it. No offense, Borla. Let's just see how this turns out. I may be wrong. It doesn't look like it changed. Huh. I thought maybe we had a little... I think that's actually their, their work. You can see how there's actually a stamp there. That's funny. Yeah, so we'll leave it at that. It's important that you wipe all this stuff dry, kind of burnish it. You see it, see it sort of flashing right there? It's not the end of the world. You just have to do it over if you don't. So once I do that level, I'll bring a dry rag and I'll just kind of polish it. But I want to, I want to get to doing this section here. To, let's just see how pretty we can make this. This is an interesting story now. So when they make these stainless exhaust systems, they put them in iron mandrels and bend them. You've probably seen them. You know, they put the pipe in there, and it bends it around. Well, those are those dies are iron. So you might wonder, I got stainless exhaust. Why is my exhaust rusting? It's because the iron is impregnated on the pipe when they bend it. And so what you're actually seeing rust is those deposits of iron. So what we're doing with this is we're removing all that rust and you can see it comes off pretty fast. 
excuse me. And it's just night and day difference. Just, that's what we want. So you can actually see where the mandrel, you know, grabbed that pipe and, and that's where it had it and it bent it. And, and these little rust deposits, we could probably take her and work with those and make those look better. But this entire exhaust system is going to be uh, a lot easier than many that I've done. And now you guys know when I sell my cars and bring a trailer, like, dang, I didn't know dry ice would make those exhaust systems look like that. Now you're in the inner sanctum. You know the details, but that's all we do. All right, so Mike says, you know, uh, let's close this segment out. Yeah, a couple seconds, because <laughs> he knows me. I, I can go on for five minutes. So uh, I'm going to spend the rest of the day, finish this out, get back up on the right front, finish that out. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll get that on camera and then tomorrow uh, we're pretty excited we're gonna go run down this left side and you're gonna see all these lines come and pop and the rocker and get all that squared away so it's gonna be cool check it out mm -hmm.